a lot has changed since the late 70s uh, when, when this conviction happened and when the Supreme Court last developed a standard for admitting eyewitness evidence in terms of the scientific understanding of what affects an eyewitness's memory. Uh, the New Jersey Supreme Court, in a, a really interesting and, and quite lengthy decision, quoted John Monahan and, uh, on the point that the social science in this area is the gold standard in the sense that social scientists can actually study the particular thing that lawyers care about, which is how reliable is a lineup. A lineup is an experiment, and those experiments have been replicated many thousands of times in the laboratory with college students, and sometimes you wonder whether college students are good subjects, but what they do have is, is pretty good eyesight for the most part. Uh, what have they found? There's uh, Beth Loftus, one of the well-known social scientists in the area. In general, uh, they have found that not only do the obvious things affect how well an eyewitness can remember something that they see, like was it light or dark? Were you really stressed out? Were you far away from the person or not? Were you intoxicated at the time or not? I think we all know that if it's dark, it's hard to make out a face. Uh, what was more surprising about the research was the degree to which the way the lineup is conducted can actually affect someone's memory. And you know, that, that is not intuitive. The way that the, the photos or the people are presented, the way they are described can dramatically affect someone's memory and also their confidence about what they saw. Uh, so these are just some statistics from the ca particular cases I looked at. I looked at a lot of trials where uh, many of which involved cross-racial identifications, uh, like, like in John Jerome White's case, the, uh, the victim was a white woman. Uh, and that's not something that police can control, but people do have a much more difficult time accurately recognizing faces cross race. A surprising number of these cases actually involve multiple eyewitnesses who all made the same mistake, which is really interesting in retrospect. At the time, of course, prosecutors would say, understandably, you know, you have three people here who all say he's the guy. Um, so across all these cases, and I don't know why this person is identifying people from behind, but... Uh, <laughs> Bad lineup construction there. Uh, at least in the John Jerome White case, they had the eyewitnesses turned around the right way. Uh, most of these cases involve some form of suggestion, and I'll talk about what happened in John Jerome's case in a second. Uh, most of the cases also involve eyewitnesses who weren't so certain, but they became certain by the time of trial. That also happened in his case. So here's his case again. The, one of the things that I didn't tell you about this lineup is that John Jerome White is the guy in the middle, actually. So he's one of the skinny guys. And he's, in fact, the one who maybe looks the least impressed with the whole set of proceedings. Uh, maybe he was diffident at the time because he knew he was innocent and sort of thought the whole thing was a joke. Uh, but he certainly doesn't stand out among the, the skinny people. And what the trial transcripts also revealed was that this was also not the first identification proceeding. Several weeks earlier, this eyewitness had been shown a group of photographs. And one of those photographs was his. His photograph was included because one of the cops knew that he had committed some kind of a burglary in their neighborhood or he was suspected of a burglary and just threw his picture in as one of the usual suspects. The eyewitness at that time was absolutely not certain, although she did remark on his photograph as some, one that looked more familiar than the others. She absolutely could not make an identification at the time. And what happened in the meantime was that she received a call from the police officer, I think it was a detective, and he said, come on to the station, we caught somebody. And that gave her the understandable impression that she was being taken, or she was being asked to come to the station because they had arrested the guy. Uh, she was expecting to see the guy uh, because they said they had arrested him. The other feature of this live lineup, which you can't really tell just by looking at it, was that John Jerome White was the only person repeated from that earlier collection of photographs to the live procedure. And that wasn't, again, an egregious pick the guy in the middle, pick the guy in the middle, but plenty of experiments have, have been done on this, and it's sort of common sense that if only one person is repeated, that signals this is the guy we care about. Combined with we caught somebody, and he's the only one repeated, that may have been what made this eyewitness far more confident by the time it got to a trial. She couldn't make an identification initially. The second time around, she can make an identification. And then by the time of trial, she, she has no doubt. So what this highlights is that the memory of an eyewitness is dynamic. 
Every time you have to recall a face and reconstruct it in, re in, uh, in one's mind, that memory can be affected. Some of these eyewitnesses in these unusual DNA exoneration cases have, have spoken about it and described how the wrong face is now in their mind and that wrong face came about because of these procedures and it's hard for them to explain but they, they know it happened. Uh, most of the Virginia exonerations involved eyewitnesses who made mistakes. Uh, studies have also been done focusing on this kind of reinforcing feedback. We got the guy. Or even it would be understandable, you might think, for an officer to tell the, the eyewitness, good job, you picked the suspect. It's not an easy thing to have to come into the station and look at a lineup. It's not the kind of thing anyone wants to do. And so to be told, good job, uh, you could see why an officer would want to do that. Being told good job, though, can predictably increase not just someone's confidence, but they will remember having gotten a better look at the face. They will remember it having been easier to make an identification. They will remember having gotten a better view. And so everything about that memory can be affected by the reinforcement or remarks that, that police make during these kinds of lineup proceedings. There have been big field studies in the last few years looking at how different lineup procedures can affect the reliability. Do you lose good identifications? Do you gain better ones? One of the big reforms that has been pushed in response, and that's being rolled out in Virginia right now, is to do these lineups blind so that the officer who is running the lineup doesn't know which one is the suspect and therefore can't give any cues, even unintentional ones, to the eyewitness. They also tend to want to show pictures one at a time so there isn't a comparison shopping effect. You don't just pick the one that looks the most like your memory of the attacker. Uh, but even just having any standard instructions at all, reminding the officers not to give feedback afterwards like good job, none of that was traditionally done. 20 years ago, there might not have been a policy at all on how to do a lineup. It was just sort of you put some pictures or people together, show it to the eyewitness. There was no particular training on it. Now it's seen as something uh, about which there must be careful instructions, and it's seen as a procedure that must be done with care. There's a model policy that, uh, that I helped to work on and, and many others in Virginia that the Department of Criminal Justice Services uh, rolled out a couple of years ago, uh, which includes a lot of these specifics on, on how to do lineups in, in a recommended way. Uh, progress in getting that adopted by departments has been, has been halting. Uh, some students here did a, a really ambitious and interesting research project that helped me do my research. They FOIA'd every single policing agency in the Commonwealth, which is a lot of agencies, and it was a lot of follow-up. It was an impressive project they took on. And it, what it gave me was a big pile of lineup policies from, from most of the agencies in the state. And what I found was that most of them were not adopting this new model policy at all. Uh, some were. Some of them didn't have a policy at all, which is actually against Virginia law. There is a law in Virginia that you're supposed to have some written policy on this subject. So we, we've been working now with the, the Chiefs Association and with other groups to try to get the word out that you should have a written policy and it should be a good one. Uh, and we're making, we're making some progress, I think. It, uh, it, the, these dramatic cases where people were misidentified have certainly helped to raise awareness that this is a problem worth paying attention to. Uh, some of these policies even say, you know, just try to avoid inadvertent signaling to the eyewitness. But of course, if it's inadvertent, it's hard to avoid it. That's why, that's why the recommendation is that the policies be done blind. Uh, we even came across policies in Virginia, but you know, again, this was a subject that police didn't pay much attention to until recently, that, uh, that really seemed to kind of encourage interaction and suggestion with the eyewitness. That's a picture from the 1950s show, The Lineup, where he's clearly you know, gesturing to the eyewitness and working with her. Uh, but there are even policies that encourage the officer to make inquiries and talk more with the eyewitness if the eyewitness is certain. Um, there was a, a Virginia case, the case of Troy Webb, where the officer clearly well-intentioned, but the, the eyewitness said she wasn't sure. Uh, and it turned out she was right not to be sure the guy was innocent. And the officer says, OK, well, well are you 99% sure? And then she says, you know, I just don't know. And he says, well, how about, you know, 97% sure? Uh, and that kind of anchoring is obviously frowned on now that we know how important it is that there not be suggestion in the interaction between the officer and the eyewitness. Uh, another problem in Virginia is that a lot of agencies just simply haven't updated any of their policies in years. A lot of them have just quite dated policies. So we're working on it. Uh, there have been efforts in other states to try to regulate lineups in a better way and to bring in the social science research. 
the Henderson case in New Jersey is a very detailed decision that has also quite detailed jury instructions and other recommendations for how to educate jurors if a case does go to trial. Uh, John Monahan testified in that case. Uh, Ken Sinclair uh, here is working on jury instructions and uh, the, apparently the, the courts in Virginia are considering um, more detailed jury instructions on, on this issue. There's a separate question of whether expert testimony should be allowed in these cases, uh, whether to allow the, that dramatic display in court, whether that's really necessary, something that, that I, have, I have concerns about. Uh, finally, back to our lineup. There is one last thing that I've misled you about. Uh, and what makes this image really memorable, and what I, don't, I don't think you'll forget this image, it's absolutely unusual and unique among the cases that I've studied in that we actually have an image of this and the following happened. So when DNA testing was done 22 years later, it turned out that the well-built round face guy was the culprit. And he was there by pure coincidence. Uh, not a pure coincidence, he was a serial rapist and he was, he was in the, the lockup for some, one of his many other crimes. Uh, but he was not a suspect in this case. He was included as a filler, and he wasn't a very good filler because he didn't look like the other guys. He actually did resemble the victim's description. But that's why he looks so uniquely unhappy to be there. Although the, although the guy next to him doesn't look that happy either. Uh, but 22 years later, it turned out that the actual culprit, by sheer coincidence, happened to be there, and he wasn't identified. And that's why I think this case provides such a powerful illustration of what can go wrong with an eyewitness's memory if the wrong procedures are used. It's not like the police were badgering her to pick John Jerome White. But there was John Jerome White in the middle. And you wonder whether she even looked at anyone else very carefully, since the actual culprit really was there, just you know, a little bit further to the right. But having seen his picture before, having been told we caught somebody, she may have just looked straight ahead and said, that's him. That's the one. And so I think that's what makes this, this unusual image such a, a, a powerful illustration of, of how subtle eyewitness memory can be and, and, and how important it is to, to think carefully about how to do these procedures correctly. So thank you again. I hope you found this, this interesting, and I'd love to talk more if you have questions. <laughs>